Okay, here he is. So, good morning, everyone. And for our last October program speaker, I wanted to end with a favorite topic of mine, and that's transportation. So my early engineering and planning career coincided with the onset of the federal program requiring continuing, cooperative, and comprehensive, or 3C, transportation planning by U.S. metropolitan areas in order to qualify for federal funding. In response, urban areas established metropolitan planning organizations called MPOs, and they were uh, organized to conduct studies and create plans for financially and environmentally sound transportation improvement projects, multimodal transportation improvement projects, highway and rail. Our MPO is the federally authorized North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority, covering 6.7 million people in 13 Northern New Jersey counties. Our speaker today is Ted Ritter. He's the New Jer North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority Manager of External Affairs. I've known Ted for several years, seeing him at uh, meetings of the Union County Transportation Advisory Board where he advises on key transportation planning issues affecting each town in Union County. Ted's a former radio news anchor and reporter, has a master's degree in journalism and public affairs from American University and a bachelor's degree in political science from Niagara University. So my pleasure to introduce Ted Ritter. Ted? Thank you very much, Marv. I appreciate that, uh, that kind introduction and uh, yeah, Marv and I sort of go back uh, uh, at Union County Transportation Advisory Board meetings, and I share Marv's enthusiasm for transportation. I actually, uh, before I started working for the NJTPA, I was, uh, I was doing some freelance reporting, and I got assigned to cover a, a meeting of the NJTPA at the Union County Transportation Advisory Board. This would have been probably sometime in the 90s. And I, as I learned more and more about it, I, I, I got very interested in, in the opportunity. Um, and that's in how I really ended up at this job. Um, so uh, it, it kind of goes back. So, uh, you know, I'm going to talk to you for a, for a few minutes and then we'll go into a presentation and then I'll come back on camera toward the end and we can do, uh, we can do a little bit of a discussion, at least I hope and I look forward to it. But uh, as Marv mentioned, um, my name is Ted Ritter. I work for the NJTPA, that's North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority. And, uh, you know, I'm very honored to be asked to, to be on the agenda today. I want to thank Marv for the invitation and Paul for setting everything up. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to a really good discussion about a, 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 a very important project that we're involved in right now at the NJTPA, and that's developing um, a long range vision for the region's transportation future. We're required federally to do this, um, but our plan is called Plan 2050. Uh, transportation, people, and opportunity is the focus. So I'm gonna welcome your input on this a little bit later on, but first I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off camera. I'm gonna try to share my screen if I can get this to work properly here. Let me see if I can do it. All right, give me a second, bear with me. I'm not super great at technology, but I'm gonna take a minute and see if she comes up. Boom. All right, so there's our logo and some nice images of the, uh, of the NJTPA region. I'll talk about that in a minute. Let me get over here and advance the slides if I can. So let's take a look at our agenda for, uh, for the, this talk today. Uh, so, you know, Mark sketched it out really, really well and described it about as concisely as I think I've ever heard uh, the description of the NJTPA and sort of how it, you know, what its purpose is. Uh, one of the struggles for me, whenever I go somewhere like, well, before the pandemic anyway, say you go to a, get invited to a holiday party or something and somebody asks you what you do, you know, by the time I explain it, it's like, you know, New Year's is over, you know, it's like ridiculously, you know, long. Uh, Marv summed it up in about two sentences. So guess what? He's hired. Um, he, he can work for us and explain this <laughs> better than I'll be able to. Uh, well, I'm going to provide an overview of the NJTPA and talk about our plan 2050. That's our long range tra tra transportation plan. 
And then I'm gonna ask you guys really for some input on some of the key questions that we're looking at going forward. And then, you know, after that, if there's time, I'll come back and we'll talk quickly about, um, about next steps. All right, so, um, so this here on the right, this red, um, this red map here, this is really the NJTPA's planning region. So we're looking at 13 counties, Northern and Central New Jersey. Let's not even get into the fact that all the way down there at the bottom right, Ocean County, when we go down there and talk about Northern and Central New Jersey, they look at me like I've got, you know, five heads. So like, you know, we are not North Jersey, but the, the federal government drew this map. I'm not gonna argue with the federal government. So let's just call it the NJTPA region and forget about North, Central, South Jersey, whatever it is. So that's our region there. It's the 13 counties I mentioned. Um, and plus, we also have the two, uh, the region's two largest cities as part of our region. That's um, Newark and Jersey City that you see um, highlighted there. Uh, we call all of these uh, sections subregions. So if you hear that word in my presentation, that's what I'm talking about, the counties and cities um, that are on our board. So our board is made, of, made up of a representative from each of the, of the subregions, plus in addition to that, okay, so we have representatives from the governor's office, the New Jersey Department of Transportation. Uh, let's see, New Jersey Transit's on there. I'm supposed to have all these memorized. Uh, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And we also have an at-large citizens representative on our board. And it's the job really of the NJTPA's board to help prioritize more than uh, $2 billion annually in federally funded surface transportation improvements. So when we talk about surface, it's really, you know, roads, bridges, transit, bicycle, pedestrian, trails. You know, we're not talking about like, you know, uh, uh, airlines or uh, I, I guess sometimes we do ferry stuff, but that has a land base to it. So that we might, we might talk about like improvements to a, a ferry landing or something for, uh, for road access or something like that. But Basically, we're talking about surface transportation improvements every year. So a lot of cheese at stake here when you talk about, you know, more than $2 billion annually. So that's kind of what we do. So let's see if I can make this work. Okay, good. So now let's talk about the NJTPA's next long range transportation plan. Um, this is one of our most important products. And I know it seems weird to hear of like, you know, an agency like the NJTPA has products, you know, no, we're not making, um, we're, we're not making, uh, you know, single malted scotch, we're not making sneakers, but we do have products. And this is one of them and probably, probably our, our, our biggest. We're required by the federal government to update it every four years. So the last time we did this, we're almost coming up on, on that, on that uh, tail end of that, uh, that four year period. So we're getting the new one ready. Uh, so it'll be it'll be all in place in time um, by by the end of that of that period that the federal government uh, mandates. So you can think of this plan really as kind of like a scope or a vision for what the region's transportation future might look like. So that means it has to include all kinds of stuff, like it's got to have forecasts for the region's. Um, uh, ever-changing population, let's say, and how we expect the transportation system to respond to the different trends that we see in terms of population and land use and things like that. And, and also, how will our travel patterns change over time? How many trips will take place in the region? You know, stuff like that. There's people that work for us that are very um, uh, numbers-minded. They live and breathe for the, the modeling and the forecasting and trying to interpret data in a way that will translate into how to prioritize federal funding to meet what we think are the most reasonable chances for, uh, for things panning out for the future. So it's, it's kind of a tall order, but it's, it, it's, it's immensely interesting. Um, now Plan 2050 also will show the region's, um, you know, the region's needs so that we can show what strategic improvements we'll need to make. So we, we spell all that out so that people can understand the correlation between the needs and the recommended improvements and the approaches and goals and things like that. And it's important, um, this part of it, because we know, and we've seen it in, in, in many of our towns 
um, here in the region. Um, we know that investing in transportation improvements not only helps all of us get around easier and safer by whatever mode you choose, but it also pays you know, immense dividends in terms of things like, well, economic opportunities and jobs, um, and more importantly, for quality of life, creating those, those types of places. We call them great places, but the types of places that you want to live and visit and, 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 and work and places that when, when people come to visit you here, you would take them to, because these are the types of places that, that, that we want to highlight. Now, as you might imagine, even without this crazy and awful pandemic that we're going through, um, everything else you know, that's going on right now with this pandemic, it's extremely challenging to plan ahead for the region's transportation future right now. Even if this thing wasn't going on, just to ask people to think about a 30-year horizon for transportation planning, I mean, in my house right now, here, here's what I'm here's what I'm faced faced with. I'm faced with with with, with two daughters under the age of 16, and 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 a wife who works full time, and a, and a house that's almost 100 years old. I mean, if I if I can plan 30 days out, you know, in in, in my environment, I, I'm doing okay. 30 years, forget about it, right? It's it's a tremendous challenge. You put the pandemic on top of that, oh my gosh, right? I mean, it's it's crazy, but. That's the challenge for us. We do have to do this. We've got to set um, a, a long range vision for the region's transportation future. So we have to rely on input from our board of trustees, planning experts, the analysis of technical data that I talked about in the last slide, the important trends and issues that we face as we look out 30 years from now. And it, it, it's a super duper tricky assignment. Basically, because as we've seen this year alone, I mean, 2020, what a crazy year. Trends often change almost as soon as they're identified. Just when you think you've got your sure footing, okay, we're going to come out of this, or okay, we figured out this hybrid balance of in-person and remote and sort of going to a restaurant, but not really. I mean, just when you think you got it figured out, boom, something else happens, right? So it's been a crazy year. Um, and some of the, the images that you see here on, on the slide, we've got the, the outdoor dining, you know, uh, uh, everyone wearing masks going around. And, and at least in, in my town, um, I live in Union County, and uh, I, I noticed uh, from, from the spring, as soon as the weather started warming up, the amount of people out on bicycles everywhere. I mean, all of a sudden, bikes are everywhere. You go to a local bike shop, you, you're, you're on a waiting list for three to six months just to get a bike in. It's, it's amazing. These are important trends that we're going to need to think about going forward. What is the region going to look like um, is, you know, as we come out of this and as we start to chart a course, you know, for going forward, right? Or how about you see the computer there with a the cup of coffee, right? And this meeting that we're doing right now, this remote, uh, remote networking and remote working and things like climate change and the electric vehicle infrastructure. All of these are the types of issues that we st we're gonna need to, to think long and hard about as we plan for the region's transportation future. Because let's face it, on the left there, if people are working more remote, does that mean there's gonna be less of a rush on the roads during the morning and the afternoon? Sure, there are still gonna be cars and trucks, but are there gonna be less? Is the morning rush hour gonna be spread out over a longer period of time? Because people are gonna do sort of a staggered shift. Or what about climate change? Are these intense storms that we've been seeing a lot of or flooding and things like that? Are they gonna impact transportation infrastructure to the degree that we're going to need to factor that in? And what about electric vehicles? Now, a few years back, the electric vehicles you know, they're still super expensive, but they're one heck of a lot cheaper than they used to be. And you know what? There are a lot more of them. The key is, as more of these vehicles go online, we know almost every single auto manufacturer, major ones, certainly all of them, have pledged to create a significant number of electric vehicles in the next, say, decade to two decades. Are we going to be able to supply the infrastructure needed to support these vehicles. 
our last chairman was Union County free elder Angel Estrada, who just retired. He drove an electric vehicle, straight plug-in, not a hybrid. His day was spent trying to figure out, okay, where do I need to go? Where can I charge up? How far do I need to go? A lot of math involved in that, right? If we want to bring more electric vehicles online or alternate fuel vehicles or whatever the future is going to look like, hey, who knows what we're going to be driving around in, in the next 20 years. We got to make sure that we account for that when we plan infrastructure, right? So that's another key, I think, um, uh, transportation issue. So let's think about, um, let me see here if I can change gears. Anyway, by the way, there's a lot more game changer issues for the future. I just wanted to highlight a few that jumped out at me, you know, just right by now. But there's, there's probably 10 more you can mention right in the next five minutes, right? But these are some of the big ones that I thought would help illustrate some of the challenge. All right, so let's, let's, let's spend a minute or two talking about the development of our long range plan. That's, that's what's going on right now. That's sort of why I'm here, actually. Uh, we're in the middle of this right now. Um, you know, it's a major effort. So obviously we've been working on it for quite a while. Uh, probably, I'd say about a year and a half, we really got down to work on, on, on developing it. Um, so for example, to help lay the foundation for the plan, we started out with a planning for 2050 speaker series. The speaker series was really interesting. You guys do this too, right? You bring in expert speakers and you have these great discussions. And we did that too. We thought, let's rely on the subject matter experts and the thought leaders to, to help us scope out what we need to be thinking about in our long range plan. So we brought these people into the NJTPA to present at board meetings and get us focused on some of those trends and issues um, you know, that we're facing not only now and in the next year, next five years, but also for the long term, long after you know, this pandemic is gone, like you know, down the road. And in tandem with our speaker series, we began developing a series of uh, background papers, taking a really in-depth look at some of these key issues. The first one we did was on active transportation. That's basically, that means like, if you're active transportation, that's, that's like walking, biking, and any other people powered type of transportation that we've been seeing a lot more of during the pandemic. So that would be like certain scooters, you know, those push scooters, that kind of thing. Um, that's active transportation. So that was our first background paper. And we're doing a couple of more this fall and winter. We're rolling them out in sequence. I think the next one is about technology. And I think the one after that will probably be maybe in December or January. That one I think is about um, climate change. Um, so let's see. So, um, so I mentioned the papers and oh, this is another thing. It, it, it is very important to think big when it comes to, to the region's transportation future, right? Uh, Barry Levinson, the, the famous movie director, once said, if you don't have good dreams, you have nightmares, right? So <laughs> it's important to, to, to have good dreams about our region's future and think positively. But, but here's, here's, the, here's the, uh, the, the catch here. The federal government requires our long range plan to be what we call fiscally constrained. And those of you that, that had a career in, in finance or business will appreciate this, uh, this dynamic. Um, fiscal constraint means we have to recommend strategies and projects and programs and policies with a level of funding that is reasonable and anticipated. So if we decide, oh yeah, we wanna create this, uh, this, uh, this, this crazy um, a network of monorails throughout the entire state that float on the air. I mean, something so pie in the sky that I couldn't even, you know, something you'd see in like a science fiction movie, you know. Uh, something that would cost so much money, there would be absolutely no way that we could fund it unless Uncle Sam came along with, you know, gym bags of thousand dollar bills, which I don't think is going to happen. So, so we have to be fiscally constrained when we develop our plan. And that's just an important point that I wanted to, that I wanted to emphasize. Um, and as far as time frame, by the way, for this long range plan, um, we think that plan 2050 will be adopted by the NJTPA board in the fall of next calendar year. So we're looking at, I would say probably September, the September to November, 2021 timeframe is when we expect to have this, this thing all put to bed and wrapped up and submitted to the federal government for their review. All right, now, <clears throat> hopefully I'm not, uh, 
hopefully I'm not talking too fast. You know, in my house, I mentioned I have two daughters under, under age 16. I, I, I have to talk extremely fast and loud in my house or I never get heard. So I think I'm so used to it by now that having the chance to speak to a group like this where I can, I, you know, I can breathe a little bit and just, uh, you know, but maybe I'm still talking too fast and loud, hopefully not. Um, but I do want to spend a minute or two talking about the development of, of, of our plan from a public engagement point of view. So let's start at what we think of as our base camp. That's the best way to think of it. Um, there's a website, it's njtpa.org, which is the main NJTPA website. But if you put a slash after that and plan 2050, you see it there up on the screen in the top bullet. That's sort of our home base, your one-stop shop for plan 2050 information. We have our super quick plan 2050 survey, it takes like less than five minutes. I think it's three questions, less than five minutes. And um, if you haven't already taken it, I'll 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 shoot you over the uh, I'll shoot you over the the link that that uh, that Paul or, or or Marv can share with you guys, so you can take the survey and and once you do, share it widely with your your contacts and friends and family in the region, because we 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 welcome all sorts of input from all corners. Um, we're also, at the website, we're going to have you know information on our upcoming virtual uh, public meetings. They're going to be coming up. Let's see and. I wanna say there's gonna be another round in December and probably another round in January. So multiple opportunities to get, um, to get involved um, as we go forward here. Uh, let's see what else. We have a short video that's um, on that website and uh, I'm trying to think. We, we also have um, something that we call TPA Tuesdays. So TPA Tuesdays complements the virtual public workshops really nicely because these are um, a series of symposiums that we're doing, featuring panel discussions on some of the key issues that we talked about earlier in this presentation and other issues that you wanna hear about as we draft uh, Plan 2050. We did the first one was, let's see, October 6th, I wanna say, and the topic was how appropriate for this, this wacky, wacky year, uh, adapting to change was the was the focus. Gosh, haven't we all adapted to change this year? I mean, we've done stuff, just this virtual meeting, think about. Um, you know, this time last year, I don't know if I'd be doing this many virtual meetings, um, you know, to the, to the degree we are. So that's a pretty much um, a look at our long range plan. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here in a second. If I can figure out how to do that. Let's see, stop share, come back on. Here we go, put my windshield back on. So what I thought, I don't know how we're doing on time. I think it's a little before 11. Uh, get some of this seltzer here going. I got to stay hydrated. Mm. Oh, by the way, before we get into our discussion, I got to point this out because one of the rock stars in our planning for 2050 series also happens to be a member of the Summit Old Guard, Mitch Erickson, and a longtime friend of the NJTPA and a, a, a seriously solid gentleman. Um, he had one of the takeaway quotes from the Planning for 2050 speaker series. It was about a year ago, I've never forgotten it. And he said, you know what? One way or the other, change is coming big time. This was before the pandemic, by the way, you talk about a prophetic statement. One way or the other, he said, change is coming. He goes, but we have the opportunity to shape the future. One way or the other, if we do or we don't, it's gonna change big time. And that's what we got to remember is that, you know, even though we may not know, we, we've got to be ready and we've got to be adaptable, got to figure out a way to be strategic about the region's transportation future. So uh, what I thought we'd do now is, um, and I'm probably going to have to rely on, on Paul a little bit to help me, you know, manage the flow of the, of the Q&A or the discussion. But I thought maybe it would make sense to to take the three questions from our survey and have that be the basis of the discussion for today. And it's fairly easy because the questions are super simple. In fact, they're so easy that we've actually, um, we're actually working on a program to take this uh, to kids to encourage them to record on video some of their ideas so that you know, we can think about uh, some, of the, some of the creative things that kids think about. You wouldn't even, uh, some of them very closely mirror what we would suggest like I want I want to be able to get in the car with my parents and have a safer trip where I go or I wish I could take the train to more places or 
Um, I wish there was a bike lane so I could ride from my house to the park. And these were all very real transportation ideas. So I thought we would take the three questions from the survey and present them kind of one at a time and just talk through, depending on how much time we have left, I don't want to eat up the rest of your guys' meeting, but maybe we could just do that and get a little bit of an insight from what you guys think. I'll write this stuff down and I'll include it with the, um, with the uh, results from our other virtual workshops and the one I'm going to do at the Union County Transportation Advisory Board next Wednesday night and make this part of the outreach for the, in the first round. And, uh, you know, next time, maybe we, we figure out a way to, to, to do either a virtual meeting or some sort of a sharing of what we're doing in the next round in December and January and keep you guys engaged going forward. Because I welcome a lot of your, you guys are accomplished gentlemen and you, you, your insights are valuable. And, um, you know, I welcome that sort of input. So the first question is, can you guys think about, um, and sort of your presidential question earlier was very similar vein, like, what in the last, say, one, two, three decades have been some of the major transportation changes that you've seen in the region? And I'm going to start off to give you an idea like what, what I'm sort of looking for. When I started at the NJTPA, I was driving from Summit to downtown Newark. And I... I, then I, I, I got a, a, an apartment closer to the Summit train station. So I was taking the train from Summit to Broad Street and I needed to get from Broad Street to downtown Newark, like over by uh, Prudential. So there was only two ways really to do it. I could walk, which was fine in nicer weather, or I could take the bus, which I found super duper unreliable. Usually when it showed up, it was already full because it was near the end of its run. Sometimes it just blew right past. There was, no, there was no connection really other than the bus or walking, or I guess I could have taken a bike or something, but it was very complicated and in bad weather, forget about it, right? Well, now you can get, you can get off at Broad Street there. You can hop on the light rail and you can go, uh, you know, right from Broad Street down past the old Bear Stadium, past the NJ Pack, right down by, by Prudential there and down to Newark Penn Station. Like, it takes, I mean, I don't even think it's a 10 minute ride. It, it's a no brainer and the service is frequent. That's a major change right there to be able to complete that. By the way, that, that was completed in the bed of the old part of the old Morris Canal where the Newark subway was built. Um, so, you know, pretty crazy. That's a pretty big change. Easy pass, that's a pretty big change. Um, so things like that. Maybe you guys could, uh, you guys could help me and, and think about some other big transportation changes that have occurred in the region in the last, say, one to three decades. Paul, how do you want to handle the, uh, the, the questions? Okay, well, actually, John is our primary Zoom host. Well, John Makeda. if you have a question, raise your hand and I will call for you and I'll unmute you at the same time. Excellent. Okay, uh, let me uh, ask Bill, Bill Tittle, uh, Tittle first. I am going to, Bill, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, Bill, can you hear me? All right. Now I'm unmuted. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, uh, very interesting uh, talk, Ted, because transportation, mainly to work, has been a big issue in my life. When I first started working, um, I was living in Wilmington, Delaware, and I had a incredibly simple reverse commute. I lived in downtown Wilmington, and my work was in the suburbs, so it was heaven. Then I took a job in consulting in New York City, and uh, moved to Westfield. And I was working in Westchester County, New York, 55 miles each way. It was like three hours of my day was spent on the Garden State Parkway, the Tappan Zee Bridge. I used to dream about commuting. Uh, and I was commuting on like a sled with uh, little rollers on it, it was it's terrible. Um, so my question is, um, 
people uh, are going to have options in the future that they didn't have in the past with all of this. Uh, you can work at home if you want. And um, I would recommend you it's really think about this in terms of your plan 2050, because um, in 30 years, I think that's going to have a tremendous impact. People reducing uh, I know a lot of my friends in Westfield, they just hate to commute into New York. So people are going to try to not do it. That's not really a question, but that's my big uh, issue uh, regarding transp uh, transportation. Okay. Uh Miguel Velez. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you. Very, very, very interesting presentation. Um, my, my question first, before the question, uh, in the last 30 years, I've noticed that there has been things that generally tend to reduce friction. So easy pass reduces friction in the travel. Uh, the uh, the uh, card uh, payment, uh, replacing the token reduces friction. Uh, the bulk, um, uh, backbone, uh, high-speed, high-occupancy lanes reduce the friction and increase the, uh, the travel speed. So a lot of the changes that I've noticed have been in uh, increasing flow. Now, as an aerospace aeronautical engineer, airflow and flow in general are my thing. So uh, do you guys, and also the thing that has affected transportation the most is the removal for the need of transportation. So working at home, the internet, um, also various modes, bicycle lanes in New York. Um, one of the things New York is experimenting with is the high-speed bus lanes or the express bus lanes within the city where only the buses are allowed to go. So how are you guys using uh, technologies and engineering from you know, uh, uh, flow dynamics, uh, maybe traffic, telephone engineering or other things to apply that to the flow of, of traffic, because traffic basically molecules in a tube, to improve the flow and also reduce the friction within the system. So when you, know, when you have five lanes merging into two, that's friction. Um, Bernoulli says you have to speed up, right? So how do you guys approach that? And what do you have in store for us? Do you have any high-speed lanes, any high-speed travel uh, trains? When they put the express lanes from Summit to New York, I lived like a king because I go from Summit to New York nonstop and it was great. So how are you guys doing that in the future? Dad, you're muted. All right, there we go. I think I'm unmuted now. Uh, first yes. of all, I appreciate the insights there from an engineering perspective, uh, very insightful. Um, uh, yeah, you're right. Um, a lot of the challenge is trying to uh, increase flow and reduce friction. That has certainly been the emphasis uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, unfortunately, what that has resulted in a lot of in addition to the positive things that you pointed out, which are all big developments, have been to make the roads wider, faster, um, expansion um, versus figuring out ways to uh, increase multimodal travel, uh, which would reduce demand on any one part of the system, help spread things out and give people some redundancy. You asked the question about technology. The first thing that came to mind when you asked that question was the results of Hurricane Irene and Superstorm Sandy, but especially Irene, because that was a that was an inland storm, and we we got tra uh, transportation data from you know uh, the, the 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 question about technology. There are uh, readers in cars, you know, that indicate uh, that, that transmit data all the time about where people are traveling. We study a lot of that data. Um, I don't have access to it, but the modelers and transportation forecasters do, uh, as part of an agreement with. Um, with the, uh, the vendor um, and they study the traffic flow. So we know where people are, when that storm, when Irene hit, 
we saw the travel patterns change dramatically. Same thing happened during Superstorm Sandy. It was a different type of storm, but we saw similar traffic patterns. So what we do is we look at, and we're looking at it right now during this pandemic too, believe me, we're figuring out based on the way people are moving and the way people are changing the way they move, uh, what the dynamics are and how they're changing. And then we have to take that and put that into, in, into our, our long range plan. I, I'll confess, I'm not, I'm not a Mitch Erickson. I'm not a super technology guy. I'm not a science guy uh, like he is. Um, which is probably one of the reasons I got into uh, I got into journalism and communications is because uh, it's never been my bag, but I can certainly dig the fact that that technology is going to be what enables us, I think, to leverage some of the opportunities that we have. Uh, for example, let's say, let's think about the old days on the New Jersey Turnpike. The only thing you had going for you at that time, as far as information about say an accident or construction was either a traffic report on the radio, assuming you were listening, or one of those gigantic, you remember those things? It was almost like a, uh, I'm trying to think of what the right word is, I guess neon sign or something. It was like a big sign that would say like congestion or accident, no information about it. Just so you knew that the reason you were sitting in this was either because of congestion or accident. Think about where we are today in terms of technology and the information that we're able to get, the know before you go kind of thing, where you can get results in your, in your, uh, in your Google Maps or any of your traffic uh, apps that you have that can, that can help you plan your trip better to avoid um, situations. So I think technology is gonna play a similar role going forward, not only in making our transportation cleaner and more efficient and safer, but also to help us figure out ways to take the existing system that's pretty much already built out in Northern New Jersey. Figure out a way to reimagine it so that it's a more modern transportation system that can get people where they wanna go efficiently and safely and have alternate choices of modes. God forbid something happens in one of those tunnels or in one of the bridges going to New York or even here in New Jersey at the shore, a major bridge that goes out because of the storm. We've got to figure out ways to have redundancy into the system. And I think technology can help us figure that out. Um, I hope that's, a, that's an adequate answer. Uh, but I appreciate your comments about Easy Pass, about the HOV lanes, the XBL lanes, those express bus lanes, um, and, 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 and all the things that you, that you emphasized about increasing flow and reducing frictions. They've all been major game changers. And some of those ideas can be used on a local scale. They're looking at possibly doing something on Route 9 North with the buses having a dedicated, it's a very narrow stretch there, especially as you get down into Ocean County, but they're thinking about possibly making some alternate times where buses will have priority. Maybe we can get people to move faster and get those buses out of the mix before cars start going into shopping mode and dining mode and things. All right, I'm gonna mute myself in case there's more questions. Oh, Toki, you're next. There's an interesting phenomenon uh, that sometimes when you build wider, faster, better roads from between distant points because you have traffic congestion and you think you need that, that the net effect is not actually to alleviate traffic, but to encourage people to, to commute farther and to move further out into the suburbs and, you know, the nice areas. And then they all move out there and build new developments and so on and so forth. And now your, your new roads are still congested. <laughs> yeah. So do you take that kind of thing into consideration in your planning? Ted, you're muted. Yeah, sorry for the delay there. Yeah, I was writing down what you were saying, Paul. Yeah, you're right. Um, and you know what? We're seeing more of that right now during this pandemic. I've got a friend uh, who's the director of the uh, transportation system for Rutgers University. He's working right now from Harvey Cedars, New Jersey on Long Beach. Oh, I'm wondering. So you're, you're seeing a lot of people are leaving um, certain areas where they may have lived for a long period of time and experimenting with living in a different place, maybe. Um, is that going to, like, we have to figure out, okay, what are the trends? What are we looking at? And how are we going to accommodate? Because you're right. If you take a place like Sussex County, 
and where there's virtually no public transit other than buses. And you put a whole bunch more people there because they, they love the location and it's, it's, it's so scenic. It's the type of place you put somebody down in Sussex County and ask them what state they're in. They would never in a million years guess New Jersey, right? It looks like something out of a, out of a, like a New England magazine or something. Well, we've got to figure that out because we know, those, we know that we can see the land use, the trends, the data. We know there are people moving to places like this and we, we can see the changes in our downtowns. Think about Fanwood, Garwood, Cranford, Union, uh, Hillside. A lot of these places are redeveloping um, parts of their downtown. They're going to look a lot different. Downtown Garwood was a largely industrial, um, had a very large industrial base in addition to its extensive retail and there were apartments and things. Look at what they're doing there now. They're building all of that new development around transportation, around that tiny little Garwood train station. I'm willing to bet you that by the time the horizon year to our plan comes around, that Garwood's going into those, those apartments and all that extra retail, people are gonna want access to, the, to New York, to Newark, the culture and arts and all the other offerings or work. And I'm betting that that's gonna require improvements going forward. Uh, Fanwood did the same thing. Fanwood built all that redevelopment in the middle of the Great Recessions. Nobody was in those units at the beginning. You go down there now, there's people all over the place in downtown Fanwood. Um, and I think Cranford was ahead of the curve on, on a lot of people. They did their redevelopment even before Fanwood did. And you can see how much that has transformed the downtown. It still looks like old fashioned Cranford on many levels, but um, think about Summit and, 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 and Cranford and how they've, how they've really uh, reimagined a lot, of their, a lot of their downtowns. I'm anxious to see what that's going to mean for the region's future, but it's the NJTPA's job to take that into account. We've got to look at transportation and land use and say, this is the trend that we're seeing in older suburban downtowns. This is what we need for transportation improvements going forward. We're going to need bike lanes to connect people, bike parking, electric vehicle charging stations. We're going to maybe need to think about our surface parking lots that only accommodate one group of vehicles at a time. Maybe there's ways we can reimagine part of those parking lots to accommodate ride shares or Uber or Lyft or something like that. Or maybe there's, there's uh, bike shares or, or e-scooters that you can rent just for short trips around town. So you don't have to drive everywhere, you know, assuming it's not pouring rain or negative, you know, 2000 degrees out, but you know, maybe there's a way to do that. So that's part of what we need to think about in our plan and certainly what we're addressing. Um, in, in, our, in our long range plan. Um, anything else as far as major changes that we've seen, and then we'll move into what we'd like to see for the future, which is probably even a more important question, but I wanted to provide some context and get people's juices going on what we think of what, when you think about transportation. Well, we have, I think, uh, more than a dozen of dozen people that still have questions. So, uh, Donald Young, could you ask your question, please? Sure. Uh, very good talk. Very uh, inspiring and uh, interesting. Um, I have kind of an odd perspective on things. First off, I'm very much in belief that we have become extremely automotive and truck oriented in the last 70 years. Uh, obviously aided and abetted by the uh, interstate highway system uh, built in the 50s and 60s. And that's great, except for one thing. It took so much uh, away from the rail system, which in my opinion is by far the most uh, efficient way to move people, say, from Union County or the other, many of the other counties into Newark and New York. Uh, and I think that's very uh, unfortunate. Uh, I, I come from a family where both of my grandfathers, my father, and even I briefly for one summer, worked for a company that built railroad cars. And so I've always had a railroad perspective, much more so than most people would. And in my opinion, one of the most important things that this new the the plans need to encompass is how to improve our rail systems so that they are safer uh and and more efficient and maybe even better in some ways maybe using uh some additional light rail 
which uh, has been implemented in some of the uh, Newark areas and so forth. Uh, I happen to know an engineer who, who helped build some of those. And I, I, I really think we need to put more emphasis on the rail system because we've put so much emphasis on the highway system for cars and trucks that uh, it, it's really overshadowed the rail system and it, and it deserves much more attention. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. That's, that's an excellent point. Um, there certainly has been, um, if you look at, you know, there was one time we, in this country where you could get on a train and uh, uh, you think about in Jersey City, right? The, the main train station there in Jersey City, and they still have the old rail boards up, the destination boards that show where you could go. You could go, you could go to Southern Ocean County from Jersey City. You could get on a train in Cranford and probably go to Ohio. You know, it, it was amazing how, um, there, how much connectivity there was by rail. And where you didn't have that, you had streetcars, you had um, all these other, you mentioned the Newark Light Rail, the original Newark subway system with those old fashioned, uh, those PCC cars that I love. They sort of look like a bus, but it went underground. Really cool stuff. I mean, yeah, that stuff has all been sort of, um, in many places, sort of been, um, been de-emphasized in favor of those uh, uh, bigger, wider, faster uh, uh, highways. Um, that certainly took place, I guess, starting around the 50s and pretty much continuing through the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. <clears throat> I think what we're seeing now um, is a recognition that uh, something has, 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 is gonna have to change. Uh, we're not only seeing um, less um, of an emphasis, I think in terms of, um, let's just take during the pandemic, there's probably more trucks on the road now delivering or vans delivering vehicles to Amazon or whatever else than there are cars during the commuting because a lot of people are doing this remote uh, hybrid working. So I'm wondering if, what is that going to mean for the future? Are we gonna have to have truck accommodations for deliveries at a set time of day versus trucks coming and going all times? Are we gonna have to change uh, some of the locations uh, in terms of we so, okay, we've made these roads super wide, super fast. Well, during the pandemic, we've seen some streets, you know, maybe some of the quieter streets in downtown, I'm thinking of Westfield as, as one perfect example of this, where they've closed off at least one lane of a one-way street and part of another major road to allow for some shared space for outdoor dining, for local civic group meetings uh, in outdoor environments so that you can hopefully be safer and have some social distancing or whatever they call it. Um, so what is that gonna, it, it, after the pandemic goes away, are people going to say, okay, I just don't want to do that anymore. I don't like outside dining anyway. Or, or no, I didn't really enjoy having a place to sit outside and listen to some live music outside, uh, in, like on the, almost near the street, as opposed to having to go to a park or something. Are we going to need to remake our transportation infrastructure? And what's that going to mean for the future of rail? Additional light rail is certainly way more cost effective than heavy rail. It's easier to build light rail than it is, you know, like say the Raritan Valley line or something like that, or the Morris and Essex or any of the major rail lines. Maybe there's a way we can take some existing capacity and figuring out a way to remake it for the future. They talked about doing that on part of the old, um, I'm trying to think of what the line was there. I think it was the Rawway Valley line. Um, there's some uh, capacity near the Raritan Valley line that would have gone, I guess, uh, at, at Cranford or Roosevelt Park, where it would have split and gone over to Port Elizabeth, I think. There's some existing tracks there. They were talking about making that like a dedicated busway or a, or a light rail, sort of a, a vehicle that could sort of go on a rail and then also change and go onto the street for a period of time. They were talking about doing that. I mean, these are the things I think that we're going to need to think about, not just as pie in the sky ideas, but real ideas, because it looks like the landscape for transportation is going to change. And we just need to figure out a way to predict what the change is going to be and to be adaptable enough that we have options. Right now, like you mentioned, the, the, the rails were intentionally de-emphasized. There was a reduction of service, reduction of destinations, uh, less funding. There's been neglect of the system. You see what New Jersey Transit's got its hands full trying to deal with now. Uh, just years and years of, of intentional underfunding and neglect, and I think it needs to be addressed. Uh, we need to fix the system we have and figure out a way to improve what we can do going forward so it's safer, more efficient, and a real honest to good way, not just commuter rail, talking about public transit. You go on the Round Valley line during the workday, not a whole lot of businessmen and women 
It's people trying to get to doctor's appointments, to work, to visit friends, to go to stores. It's real transportation. There's a need there or these people wouldn't be riding it. So we need to figure out a way to do that. And it's probably gonna be a combination of multiple things, multiple modes to get it done. Rail's gonna be a big part of it. So any other ideas before we move on to, um, I guess we really have kind of two more little quick questions, but um, is there anything else we want to address before we go on to what you what else you guys would like to see going forward? Real things that would make it a difference to make it easier, safer, better to get around where you are. Well, if I may uh, suggest something, we have uh, about 12 speakers, 12 questioners, but perhaps we could uh, delay this. We are, you, you are second, the second question you have, and after the, uh, 11.30, who wants to, whoever wants to leave will leave, and we can continue this for, if, if it's all right with you, for a while longer. Sure. Okay, okay. now, uh, since we have blue hands here to, uh, uh, to ask question number one, I would suggest that for the second, second issue that you have, Whoever wants to ask a question, you raise, uh, you don't raise a hand, you just press yes. So I will be able to separate people who, who, have a, who have a question that we're currently talking about to the question that we will be talking about. So if you have any question uh, that uh, Ted will pose right, uh, to, to the issue that Ted will pose, just click yes. All right? Okay. Right. Ted? Ted? Can I say the question again, so. Uh, basically what I wanna see is uh, some ideas on what about the region's transportation system you would like to change for the future. Like um, one example, like for me is I live in uh, Union County and my daughter and I are avid bikers and we like to ride around on our bicycles all over the place. And they just experimented during the pandemic with a pop-up bicycle lane going from sort of where our neighborhood is to downtown Westfield. And it was great, but it was on a busy street and there wasn't really a lot of separation. It was a little tight, but it was a change. And it was, it was, it was somebody had the political will to try something, right? So for me, I would, for the future, would like to see some more emphasis on, on infrastructure for biking and walking um, so that if I lived close enough to where I wanted to go shop or say I wanted to go downtown and buy a bagel or something, I don't have to get in the car and drive and park in a parking lot and, and it's a short trip, less than a mile. I could have walked, I could have biked. If I had a place to park my bike, if I had a dedicated bike lane, if I felt safe on the road with my daughter so I didn't have to worry about getting pummeled by a Chevy Suburban on my way to go get a, a cookie or something, you know? So when I saw that bike lane, I thought, man, I hope they do this again. I hope they put more bike lanes in there because guess what? There's a lot of people like me that would walk downtown if they felt they was safer and their sidewalks weren't all broken up. And, and, and you felt like you, when you got there, you didn't have to chain your bike up to a sign and get yelled at by the bakery guy because you know, you're blocking pedestrian traffic, you know? Well, you know what? If I had a bike rack that near your business or somewhere in the downtown where I could park, instead of only at the train station, maybe I, I would ride more. So that for me would be an idea, like thinking for the future. I'd like to see more emphasis on, on bicycle pedestrian infrastructure. What are your ideas? Like, what do you, what would do it for you? If you could say, I want like one wish list, like for Santa Claus, wish list for transportation future. What would the thing you'd pick as your, as your wish? Okay. Uh... David Ogdens, you have a question? Yes, um, actually um, that was just a very good speech because that's what I would love to see. Um, my wife and I, we love riding bikes and have been to countries like Netherlands and they have dedicated bike lines, uh, bike lines all over the place. I mean, I would love to, <clears throat> bike into New York City. There is no way you can bike into New York City. Impossible. Uh, try the George Washington Bridge. That's about the only possible way. But when you get over the bridge, uh, it, it's literally impossible. So we don't even make it, you know, possibility. Uh, so 
I think a lot of people, if they could bike into the city, would alleviate a lot of traffic. Uh, and, you know, exactly what was just said, uh, you know, we don't have any bike lanes around here. There is nowhere you can go from A to B safely. Uh, sometimes there is, uh, yeah, you really have to go into the traffic. So that would be my wish list. Um, and also, I think if we can expand on the light rail or, you know, because I would also love, I live in Berkeley Heights, I would also love to get to the airport without having to take a car. And the only way, th there is no possible way to do it without getting wet and without taking this, uh, you know, because Newark Airport has no, nothing that goes around it that extends elsewhere. You know, um, everything is made for parking. Uh, you, you know, they got their um, uh, service inside there, but it's only going to the parking lot. So that would be another wish list. Really, and, and I see this, and I know we had this uh, discussion, the other thing, but this new uh, American mall, um, you know, I just don't know if they, you know, everything is cars going there, cars going there, but one little train station that I've heard, you know, in the past when they had concerts were disasters. So I really think we need rail service, uh, light rail, and more ways of getting bikes. Can, can I bike to the American Mall? It'd be, that would be a nice thing to do. Impossible. So that's it. Bikes. That's a good point, uh, David. That's a very good point. We have a guy <clears throat> that works for the NJTPA. He lives in North Plainfield. He, on occasion in the summer, usually in the spring before it gets too hot, so like, you know, the May to June time frame, and then again, maybe in September, he bikes sometimes from North Plainfield to downtown Newark. You, man, if you ever wanted to listen to a testimonial of what's wrong with the with the transportation infrastructure from a bike uh, perspective, you talk to this guy. I mean, even where he feels the road is wide enough to ride, there's like rubble and glass and pieces of debris on the road. I mean, it's it's a contact sport. It's like something out of like a, a, a dystopian uh, uh, movie, you know, where you're, you're trying to dodge all this, uh, all this uh, vehicles, high-speed vehicles and, and all this debris on the side of the road. And even in places where there might be a bike lane, it might not connect. So you're okay in town, but then what if you want to ride somewhere farther? Like you mentioned about the, the, getting to the George Washington Bridge, you know, okay, you can get across the bridge on a bike, but what happens before, what happens after, you know? Uh, so it, it's an interesting question and it's, it, and it's certainly a, a challenge and you're right. Um, Everything is sort of made for parking and vehicles. That's sort of the way the system was engineered. Um, unfortunately, a lot of what we had was dismantled, but um, hopefully we can figure out a way to remake it. Paul, you had your hand up. Did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, I, I want to add a, a short PS to Dave Ogan's point and yours. And that is besides just better bike lanes and infrastructure for bicycle riding, I would like to see all, all public conveyances have better facilities for carrying your bike with you so that you can actually do a bike ride somewhere else in the state without having to put it on the top of your car. And I think Europeans do this a lot better. They do indeed. It's, it's frustrating to see the way things are done. Uh, uh, I, I think David mentioned the Netherlands as an example. That's a perfect example. Um, it's frustrating to see how well it can be done. Uh, and it's like, uh, it, it, they don't even think about it. It's just part of the culture there. Whereas here, you try to bring your, your bicycle on a New Jersey transit train at any Raritan Valley station. And if you're in the middle of the day, uh, you're probably okay, but you're still gonna get sort of like some friction from the conductors and, well, you're not really supposed to have the train on during these times, the bike on the train, and you can put it over here, but you can't put it here and then you're in the way. They just didn't think about any of that stuff. And exactly. yeah, you could put your bike on a rack on the front of the buses now, and, used to be only in South Jersey you could do that. They finally made it in North Jersey and Rutgers University has it. And they do a much better job, I think, than, than transit of accommodating bicycles on buses. But if it's a crowded bus and it takes you five minutes to put your bike on there, you're gonna get a lot of looks when you get on that bus about people that are in a hurry to get to work. It's just, 
it's just that tension, you know, and it just, it needs to, something's got to change because we can see what a difference it would make if we could just reduce by a little bit some of the, some of the single occupancy vehicles, people in cars, and just, if we did 10% bikes, it would just, it would free up so much more capacity. Could be a big game changer. Any other ideas? Um, okay, uh, Edward Paskin. Okay, okay, okay. One thing I find, you know, I've gone out, used a bicycle a lot more this year. I find a big problem is riding between Merck. I live in Union between, be, oh, off Salem Road, riding between Merck and let's say in through Kenilworth, there's by the parkway. It's, I don't feel it's safe for bicyclists, creating more safety area for bicycles. That's a big area problem, that area. You know, I've also noticed the train station has been empty. I like to see, you know, better, you know, train service. Let's say maybe the Raritan Valley line extended back into Pennsylvania again. But I think we need to address the bicycles as create doing something in that area. That's can I interrupt for a moment, thing. everybody? I, can I interrupt for a moment? Listen, it's um, 11.35. The meeting officially ended five minutes ago. Uh, obviously, Ted is, is happy to stay on and chat with us for a while longer. And we usually do go a while longer. There is another meeting queued up before noon. And so, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, we, we could finish, we could do the formalities and then keep talking or we could just say, let's take a small number of questions and then move on. But if we do, let me encourage everybody to make your questions brief, your comments brief, so that we can get to the end of the list and even the answers. Paul, I noticed in the uh, chat room, uh, Mitch Erickson said that he would work um, with me to establish a way to uh, contribute individual opinions after the meeting. Yes, and that's important. So let's go. I can post my email address in the chat box and you can, you know, I, I can appreciate that it takes time to think about this. A lot of people, a lot of times when we talk to people, they say, you know, it's hard to think of an idea on the spot, but if I had like a few minutes to think about it, I probably could have come up with a lot <laughs> you know, more eloquent. So, you know what? Take a few minutes and think about it. Take a couple of days and think about it and shoot me an email later in the week or give me a phone call and, you know, we can BS about it and we can, you know, hopefully figure out a way because I want to write all this stuff up as a report and say, I talked to the Summit Old Guard. This is the overwhelming you know, summary of what I heard and yeah. I want it to accurately reflect that. Okay, so maybe we can find a way to do a group chat by email. So that it's not just a one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, we're still continuing the conversation. So John, take it away. It's up to you, what we do okay, next. Okay, uh, let's, uh, okay, Jim Fagan. Uh, thank you. Uh, with regard to the change for the future, uh, Port Newark and Port Elizabeth, um, when those cargo containers are offloaded there, uh, they can reach and be delivered to 80 million people within 24 hours. Uh, the truck traffic that the port area uh, generates is enormous. Uh, query, uh, could there be a way, for instance, where those containers could be offloaded onto a rail siding and shipped out 50 or 60 miles and then unloaded there onto trucks to be distributed wherever they need to go. If you were able to mitigate the truck traffic in that Port Newark, Port Elizabeth area, uh, that might serve, uh, solve a, a lot of the problems that are being raised. That's an excellent, um, an excellent observation, Jim, you're right. Um, we know that between now and 2050, we know that freight, and, and you know what, the pandemic is probably going to make this even more dramatic. It's even going to increase more. But I think they were talking about something like a 20% increase in freight traffic between now and the next 30 years. Can you imagine, I mean, things are already in, in, this, in this region with freight traffic. Um, you know, I can't imagine a 20% increase without making some additional accommodations, either in either in doing something super creative like Jim suggested, which is to offload the containers onto rail, get them out of the region and then spread out the distribution so that it's not impacting so much traffic. Or if it's coming up with other creative ways, um, they, they, in the old days, they used to have um, uh, cross harbor floats. Uh, they would transport some containers by, by barge. I think there's only one or two and I think they're both automobiles. I don't think they, I don't think there's any other goods that are transported by float 
um, that they used to for decades. It was a humongous operation. Um, I would think that now with the, um, with the improvements in maritime technology, you'd be able to figure out a way to reactivate some of that and get some of those trucks off the road. Um, even if it was, a, again, a small percentage, it might make enough of a difference where we could accommodate for whatever future growth we anticipate. But that's an excellent, uh, excellent observation. I'm glad that Jim brought up freight because we hadn't heard that yet. Okay, we have about, I think, three or four questions left. So let's just do those and then we'll go to your next question. Okay, Peter Moret. Okay, am I unmuted? Yes. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, a few years ago, there was a lot of excitement uh, between Princeton and New Brunswick about a new train station. And uh, housing was put in there, apartments and a lot of infrastructure, fountains and access roads and uh, Starbucks and other facilities. And there was, a couple of years ago, there was what was supposed to be an opening of the train station. The trouble is the train station itself has not been put in place. So a lot of time has been spent on the, the infrastructure and uh, fountains and such like, but the train station itself has not been put in place. Uh, in the last few years, there's been no progress with the train station. Uh, uh, my question is, why not? What happened to that vision? And everybody was so excited about it because it was going to take a lot of people off the highways and they would be able to live in these new, this new housing right by the station. It would have been very uh, helpful to mass transit, to have that mass transit and to get cars off the road. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, that's a good point. I'm not super familiar with that with that project. Certainly, the particulars of why that was never built. But you're right. Uh, it seems to me that a bet was made, and they just they knew that if they built it, you know, what's the old statement? If you build it, they'll come. Well, here they built it, and they didn't uh, finish it. Finish it. Um, so there's 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 no connection. Um, that's a tremendous problem. It's a, a lot of times it's a lack of vision. Um, a lot of times it's a lack of political will or changing political will. And a lot of times it's somebody ran out of money. I'm not sure if there was a combination of things on this one or if something else happened, but I can certainly find out. Um, but it illustrates a, a bigger point, um, which is the connection between transportation and land use. How can you, if you look at the locations where a lot of redevelopment is occurring uh, right now, um, most of it, not all of it, but most of it is centered around transportation. We had an old uh, 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 previous chairman of the NJTPA board, Peter Palmer, who's a Somerset County freeholder for many years. He's still active with the Raritan Valley Rail Coalition um, in his retirement. And he said a great quote. Um, he said, transportation is the game board upon which the economy is played. And boy, is that right. Um, <laughs> you can't build all this stuff and then not give people a way to get there uh, or a way to connect and it doesn't make any sense. So. Um, I'm not sure what happened with that station, but I, I you know, I, I can follow up and find out and, and we can use that as a, um, as a tale of, that illustrates the need to really connect the better plan land use and transportation up front, not as an after the fact. Okay. Philip, I possess it. Yes, hello. Uh, speaking to you from uh, the Seattle, Washington area. And I want to recommend that the folks in the TPA should reach out to Seattle, Bellevue, Washington area. There's been an incredible amount of huge growth of population and a lot of buildings. And specifically in regard to the uh, use of uh, public transportation as well as bicycles. It seems to be not, the air, entire area is extremely bicycle friendly, but bicycle friendly number one in infrastructure, of course, but number two, and way more important, is bicycle friendly in attitude, motorist attitude. And that's something that you start need to start in grade school with the children, that that attitude needs to, to change if you expect to do anything meaningful with transportation and bicycles in the North Jersey area. Because if it's one person, one car forever, you're just going to increase demand and never be able to pay the entire state over. So, but please consider reaching out to Seattle to see what they do because they've had huge growth and yet it's just as accommodating for bicycles now as it was 10 years ago. Thank you. That's great, Philip. I appreciate that. And you're right. Um, there is an attitude. Um, I see it as a, I, I, I ride my bicycle, or at least I was when I was still working in downtown Newark 
from my house to the train station where I rent a bike locker and I put my bike in a protected uh, locker for the day. I can't tell you how many times I've gone down North Avenue uh, in Westfield and been yelled at by drivers to get up on the sidewalk, get out of the road. Um, I, it, it's, it's, it's really, it's uncomfortable and it's, there's a lot of uh, profanity and yelling and, and there's vehicles sort of intentionally moving over to the curb to try to push me, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty hairy and you're right, there is this bias against it. Um, I'm in a big car uh, with an eight cylinder engine. I'm going fast, get out of my way. Um, it's got to change because you can't fit any more cars on the road the way it is now. Um, so you're right. And I will definitely bring up the Seattle, uh, you said Bellevue, right, Phil? Bellevue, yeah, it's right right across the, the water from Seattle, but it, it, they've had incredible growth and uh, they just, they accommodate, even during construction and road closures, they'll specifically indicate bicycle paths and the way to go and they'll build, you know, temporary, around construction sites and all this. So you can get anywhere you want, the ferries, the, everything on the bicycle. Right? Great. Yeah. Well, maybe we can reach out to them and, you know, for the NJTPA, mm -hmm. maybe get, get somebody there to do a webinar or a speaker uh, thing and show us some examples of what we're right. we'll yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, their whole bicycle master plan too. You wanna have, <laughs> they've got a phenomenal bicycle okay. master plan. So. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity to reach out. Yeah, okay. thank you. And I've rejoined for 2021, folks. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think uh, we'll make this the last question uh, from Donald Young again. Yes, uh, I'm be very brief. I'm very much in favor of uh, what uh, has been discussed about improving the uh, pedestrian and bicycle paths. And I'd like to just point out one thing that hasn't been even mentioned about that. And that is that from the standpoint of health and fitness, uh, that would really help if we could promote more walking and bicycling, uh, particularly for people who are retired or have the time uh, to do it. Uh, I'm a bicyclist and I have to be very careful about where I bike around Cranford, Westfield, and, and pick the parks as much as I can in order to bicycle safely, because I know exactly what Ted is talking about. Uh, if you bicycle in some places, uh, the automobile drivers uh, resent it and they, uh, they, they don't really uh, give you a polite uh, chance to bicycle. So I think the health perspective is something that we frequently forget about uh, when we're, we're only thinking about moving people around but it's very much a factor for walking and biking. Thank you. And a very good talk, Ted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Thank you. I'm glad you brought up the health uh, perspective. That's a very important one. Okay, well, I posted my email address in the chat box. Maybe Mitch uh, or Paul um, could share my email address with the group uh, via email. And if you guys have additional thoughts in the next few days, or even a week or so, whatever your convenience is, shoot, you know, uh, send me an email or give me a phone call and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to include it with the summary that I'll write up for this meeting. And, uh, um, you know, I look forward to any additional uh, opportunities to, to, to incorporate your comments and ideas. It's been enlightening. And I gotta say, um, it mirrors a lot of what we've heard already um, from a lot of different people. I think people are kind of fed up with the way things um, have gone and I think, they want change, regardless of location, regardless of age, regardless of ability. Um, they want better, easier, safer, more intelligent ways of getting around. Hopefully we can deliver in this long range plan. And I really want to thank you guys for all of your insights and for having me on this agenda. I apologize for taking longer than I was uh, uh, allotted, but uh, hopefully- No, no, you know, I no need to apologize. One thing about Oka is we have a whole lot of questions to ask. We always do. So, so that's- Oh, well, that's great. I appreciate that's it. That's the territory. Hey, uh, Marv, why don't you wrap it up? Okay, if we can post the uh, certificate. Yes, indeed. I do not have it on my computer. Does anyone else? <laughs> Mark? Okay. Uh, let let me dig it out. I think we have to end it because okay. we're out of time, but we will do the follow-up. Here we go. Here we go, Joel. So we have two ways of expressing our thanks to um, our speaker, to Ted. First,
This is our certificate of appreciation. Wait a second, Joel. Wrong one. Got it? Joel, that's the wrong one. Well, that's mine. Yeah. I've no. got to post Ted's. No, hold on a right, second. I'll, I'll, there it I'll is. Take okay, I'll, I'll take okay good. That's the one. Good. That's the one. That's the one. So this is our certificate of appreciation, and it bears the image of an orchid. And that's because Summit was the orchid capital of the East when Old Guard was founded in 1930. And so it says, we are happy to take this way of expressing our gratitude to you, Ted, for the contribution you've made to our organization. And we have a second way of expressing our thanks, and that's the Old Guard salute, a big round of applause. So let's all do that if we can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, Marv, thank you very much for that certificate. I, I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's been enlightening. I, I've heard some great ideas. And I have a lot of respect for you guys and your organization and the different ways you guys have contributed. Um, it, it, it means a lot to engage. I love talking to people and just hearing different perspectives. And this was a great discussion today. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Ted. It's great. Thank you.